Hi everybody, so my name is Christian and I come from the, the other side of, of the University of Gothenburg, the Faculty of Humanities uh, around uh, Necrostamen and so on. And I'm and also part of the Center for Antibiotic Res uh, Resistance Research, as you see up there. And, and my subject then is philosophy and ethics, and I work a lot in an area called bioethics and, and an area called public health ethics, which then applies uh, ethical aspects to a lot of different kind of medical and, and health-related issues. And, and f I'm now starting to get into this issue quite a bit. And this lecture is going to basically just introduce a little bit what are the main ethical challenges uh, raised by the, uh, specifically by the uh, drug resistance and especially the antibiotic resistance uh, challenges. So first a little about what ethics is then. I mean, ethics is, uh, when we deal it like this, not, not a set of rules or anything like that, but rather an area of questions. So questions that are about what is good and what is bad, what is better or worse, what is more desirable or less desirable, what we should do and what we should not do. And maybe most important, why uh, we have uh, one or the other answers to these kinds of questions. Um, so, um, and this is important in various aspects of this that are important in this and many other areas. First of all, ethics is very important for understanding uh, all kinds of human situations and, and, and uh, complexities like society and so on, because people have ethical values and they act on ethical values and to understand how people react and think uh, regarding different issues, you need to understand these uh, values and ethical stances in various ways, even if they are not the same as your own. That's the trick, right? So it's easy to understand people who agree with you, but understanding people who disagree with you is often a little bit more difficult and challenging. Uh, so that, that's one important aspect. Another important aspect in this and in the other areas is that in order to sort of respond to some problem or something like that, you need to be able to change how people act and think. So, and in a, so you need to have an idea on how you should change people's values and norms uh, and how they might be changed in unexpected ways by the way that you do things. So from, from the area of public health, for instance, you, you have the famous example of the, the swine flu vaccination campaign, for instance. A lot of people remember this, right? So, so first everybody, oh, I need to get vaccinated because the minister was on the television and told me so, basically. And everybody got vaccinated, and then there was an unexpected side effect, and, and then there's a reaction to that. And, and the reaction is in one way silly because, of course, everybody knows that also vaccinations have risks. So that you might have risk. This was a new vaccine, so of course there might be a risk. As with every pharmaceutical, there is a risk. Um, but in another way, it was not stupid because when the minister went on TV and said this is important, you expected that this would be really safe. Uh, so... Uh, and this is because of your political expectations, right? So, and this is just one tiny bit of the very complex set of values and norms and expectations that we have towards each other in a society that then can have huge effects. So next time they will roll out the vaccination programs, they will be very wary about the, uh, what people will say, right? The, the third thing is that in order to then to decide what you're supposed to do, to decide what is right and what is good and, and what to go for, you need to be able to justify your actions. So you will often have different proposals what to do. And you, in order to say that one is better than the other, you need ethics to justify uh, one rather than the other. Say that this is the better thing to do and, and, and this is the worst thing to do according to these facts and these ethical ways of looking at what's better and worse. So I'm going to give some more examples about these things uh, in a minute. So, and this, this is perhaps most important to understand. That ethics, it's easy to think about ethics as just something you do between people. But it's not only that. Uh, so it's, of course, our individual act, uh, you know, actions, keeping your promise to your friend or, or things like that. That's ethics, of course. But also when you act as a professional, 
as a doctor, as a teacher, as a, in my case, then a university professor and so on, when we act as consumers, when we buy meat or fish in the shop, or when we, you know, go to the dental clinic or health clinic and buy some healthcare service or something like that, uh, um, how we relate to our friends and our families, how we relate as political citizens, and so on and so forth. All of this is part of what you do as individuals. And all of this ca you can apply ethics to, of course, what you should do. Uh, but then we also work in groups together. And uh, often, in order to change important things, we need to work in groups. I'm going to talk a little bit more of that. And you can also say that, for example, that the hospital theme acted better or worse, or something like that. Um, then we have institutions like uh, political agencies or uh, institutions like the law, for instance. That's a huge institution, the legal system. Um, business companies, like pharmaceutical companies, for instance, who you can also apply ethics to them and say that they act better or worse or in the right way or the wrong way, of course. And then, of course, the political level, the overly when you have states that act, and in this case, what's perhaps most important to look at is how, they, how states act towards these others, but also how they act towards each other uh, regarding international collaboration. Since, as Gunnar just explained, that this is not only a Swedish uh, challenge, it's a sort of a global challenge that, that needs a lot of international collaboration. So, and then when it comes specifically then to the drug resistance, antibiotic resistance challenge, uh, ethics is, of course, the whole idea that this is a challenge is, of course, based on an ethical assumption. So all the things that, you talk, that we talked about the, the previous hour here, lots of facts about different things, about how things can go and so on and so forth. And in every of these ideas, you formed some ethical analysis without thinking about it. You were thinking thoughts that, oh, that's bad, and that would be good to, you know, do something about. And here we should do like this and that and that. I, next time I'm in that kind of situation, I should avoid doing this kind of thing, or I should rather do that kind of thing. So the whole idea that this is a challenge that we need to respond to is based on the idea that we can justify some kind of ethical stance. So intellectually, we, we need to have ethics, basically. Otherwise, we don't have a problem, <coughs> basically. And depending on what ethics we have, we might develop different ideas then. And then, of course, when you try to do something about it, you will encounter a lot of conflicts of interest and concerns that necessitate an ethical assessment. And that's the thing I'm usually sort of thinking about, that you have some kind of conflict here. So, for example, regarding coercion against individuals. So, so Gunnar was taking up, so it's very important, a distinction between someone who is infected and someone who is colonized. But already today, people who are colonized are being screened and somehow, you know, surveilled a little bit. They are sort of, uh, society look at them a little bit closer and they will apply a little bit more safety arrangements when they deal with them in a hospital, for instance. If you're infected, you might be isolated for long times. There might be a lot of precautions around you. And this will, of course, be cost to you as an individual. This is not to help you. This is to help other people. And, and to help society, right? Uh, so there might be a conflict here. So how much of that? Um, so when we screen people, it's very easy to stigmatize people. This is well known. So just saying to someone that, okay, so you have a risk here. You, you're colonized by this um, ESPL, yeah, bacteria, for instance. You're colonized by this. Most of these people, even if you colonize, will never get an infection. But, of course, there is a risk. Uh, so, and what does it do to you to get this information? How will you start to behave towards your children? How will you start to behave in, in more social settings at the workplace, for instance? How will this sort of affect social relationships? And it's very easy to see how this might create a backlash. So it might be that it's so uncomfortable to get this kind of you know, notice when you visit a hospital that you might want to stop visiting hospitals. Now it's not really good anymore, right? So here, here you see one, one is easy aspect of why this might be important. To, to then do an ethical... How much of this kind of question is okay in different kinds of situations? 
or political actions that restrict then access to healthcare, like antibiotics, for instance. So say that we take away some of the permission that the doctor have to prescribe certain antibiotics, especially these, the most important ones, the last resort ones, for instance. He has to apply, or she has to apply to a committee or something like that in order to prescribe it to a normal patient. Or you have to refer the patient to a specialist or something like that. It becomes more complicated. Uh, <clears throat> and this, of course, restricts the freedom of the professional, right? And it also restricts the freedom of the patient to get an antibiotic as easy as you used to be able to get it. And this means maybe that you have to stay home from work a week more or two weeks more or something like that. Your employer won't like that. And so on and so forth. So you have all these kinds of things. Or the thing with, with the food production with fish and, and meat then that you use a lot of antibiotics here. And of course, the, the most salient effect of that is the cheap meat and fish that we buy every day and eat. Uh, this is of course uh, because you can have huge production yields and this takes down the price. So if we take away this production method, the price will go up. So that will also be a conflict, right? <clears throat> okay, so to do something about it, we want to put a lot of money and effort into research programs, for instance. That's what we like in care. Lots of new research on new antibiotics, for instance. But then again, you never know what that's going to lead to, right? Because research is like that. It's a big question mark, and so many times you just hit the wall and it doesn't lead to anything. Uh, so you want, and, and still it costs a lot of resources. So, so, and it's a high risk thing. So how should you think about that? Um, or should you think that we should try to uh, introduce, for example, new antibiotics more easily so we don't test them so much. We introduce them quicker. So this is a way of trying to curb this resistance development. For instance. But then, of course, the antibiotics will be less safe than they were before. But we get new ones quicker so we can curb the resistance development. Well, to the, pri the price is paid by every patient to take a greater risk of a side effect, of course. So... so uh, and how should we distribute these different kinds of benefits? Because there are, of course, benefits we want to get out of this, like a better functioning healthcare system, take down the threat of resistance. And how do we distribute these benefits and the burdens between different parties? And, of course, globally also between different countries. So here you can see that this problem has a similarity with the climate change policy problems, right? So... <clears throat> Right, so here are some signal words to, to make you see that you have these big words being actualized here and you know for every word like this there are like a thousand ideas about what it is about and you have lots of disagreement. So that's where the ethics comes in to have a reasoned uh, argument about that. <coughs> and then depending on what ethical standpoint you will develop, you, you might then have very, very different ideas about what to do. So, and this will, of course, have effects on political action, political negotiations, and so on and so forth. So, and it will have effect on how we can expect people then to respond to what is being done to curb uh, this challenge. Right, so here's a very, very quick. This is the flash course of moral philosophy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, different kinds of traditions here. So, one tradition, uh, usually called deontology, is the idea that there are these things we should never do. Uh, and, and certain things should never be done, right? And, and the tricky thing here is, of course, to identify what are those things. Should we never lie? Well, everybody, I think, can think about situations where it would be okay to lie. Should we never harm other people or, or sort of expose them to physical risks? Well, I think we accept physical risks to a bit, and we also accept that we build societies where people are harmed. We have traffic. So um, that's kind of uh, proof number one, right? So, and these kinds of things. Uh, should we, should we uh, be allowed to cause other people's death? That might also, also be on the table in this kind of discussion. So, so the, the problem is, of course, then, so what is this? This kind of the forbidden things to do if you want to be this, uh, have it, uh, ethics like that. And then, then the conflict is this. So suppose that this forbidden thing is what will help you to deal with the antibiotic resistance challenge. How should you think about that? 
So, uh, because I think everybody sort of agrees that this kind of ethical thinking is a very important thing. In your personal lives, certain things are just off limit. You don't do them. And also in society, certain things are just off limit. Whatever you think the ground for that is, uh, you will have a challenge for that kind of important thinking when you have something that in order to be handled, you need to do these off limit things. There are certain uh, uh, situations where this occurs, this might be one of them. Another known situation like this is war. So where things become so extreme, so that sort of we start to think that normal rules don't apply, right? This is why we want to avoid war. And this is also why we want to avoid this kind of situation to escalate. So another idea is this, the idea of freedom. That freedom is a really important thing. And here you have the idea of individual rights to, to self-determination. So everybody should have as much uh, room for self-determination that's sort of compatible with everybody else having the same right, basically. So we shouldn't coerce each other in any way. Well, this seems to be very difficult to uphold perfectly uh, in the face of this kind of challenge. So, for example, when you have someone who is infected, for instance. And how should we think about state coercion and, and regulation, for instance. So how should we think about the freedom of businesses here to, to sort of, so for example, these things that uh, these pharmaceutical factories that emit a lot of antibiotics in, into the environment, for instance, should, we let, should they be free to do that? How should we think about that in terms of this kind of ethics? So this, this is one example, right? And then the third big tradition is what's called consequentialism in English, consequentetik. Uh, in Swedish, um, and here the focus in not so much what, what happens to the individual or some rule, but what happens overall, right? And here you can sort of, what, what, you, lose, um, what you lose on the swing set, you take away on the other thing in the Tivoli, right? So, so you can compensate a loss here with a benefit over there, which means that you allow yourself to sacrifice individuals, for instance, uh, in order to benefit other individuals. And this is, of course, a controversial idea, uh, but this is also being done to some extent, right? You, so you need to have some idea then what these good consequences are supposed to justify actions like that. What is the goodness here? What kind of thing can justify, for example, knowingly uh, having someone being exposed to extra risk or harm, for instance. What, what kind of goodness is in there? So everybody agrees it's not money, so it's something else. Well, the money is the most easiest thing to count. It's not that. And, and here's the most controversial thing. The individual here has really no standing. Here, it, the individual is everything. Up there, it depends on the rule. So here you can see conflicts between social interests or political interests and your interests as a private individual. So suppose you're colonized and you don't want to be surveyed by the hospital, but you want to get treated in the hospital, so you refuse to fill in the form. What should happen? So that's an easy example now. So here's one thing that sort of, so ethicists disagree around this very much, but here's one thing that most people agree on, that whatever, we, whatever solution we have here, it should be kind of a universal solution. It should apply equally to everyone. This is a little bit, a bit like the idea that the law should apply equally to everyone if it's going to be bad, good law. And, and, uh, and it's sort of, so it shouldn't be sort of ad hoc who is treated in what way. It should be some kind of system to it. So this is a good ethic at least has to be that in order to be good. But apart from that, there's a lot of disagreement. Okay, <clears throat> so this is one aspect. So whatever idea like that you have about ethics, you have this further dimension, namely how you divide up the responsibilities for doing the good and the right thing, right? And here you can have a lot of conflicts in this, this area. So here's... Here was a sort of picture I tried to make very simplified about different kinds of roles that we take and functions that we have and institute perspectives that we have in this area of drug resistance and antibiotic resistance. So say you have a clinician, a doctor or a nurse or someone like that, treating a patient or meeting a patient or something, and then you can think from the perspective of clinical healthcare, and then your ethical stance will usually be, I'm going to do the best for my patient. 
basically like that. Well, if you now just move one little slot down and think that, okay, so if, if, you're kind, if you're not that kind of clinician, if you're a public health doctor, you will not think like that. You will think like that, I will treat this individual so that it's best for public health. So this is what happens, for example, when we have an epidemic or something like that in society, that you might actually confine someone, lock them in, not for their sake, but for the sake of other people. So that's an example of that, right? So in the sense of public health, the clinician in the first box might prescribe the antibiotic to the individual so they can go back to work quicker. Uh, in the second box, they will not. So they will think about not this individual but public health. So perhaps this person will lose their temporary job because of that. The way things are now, right, in, in, the, in the work market. So these can be really serious things at stakes for an individual that competes with this public health concern. You have a researcher meeting in the clinical healthcare system, someone like Anne here, or, or, or myself for that matter, and, and I'm interested in these people not as object of my care, but as sources of knowledge. And this is a well-known conflict in research ethics, that these, these are not the same thing. They don't need to do... So, you're, basically, when you're a researcher, you look at people in a little bit instrumental way. Uh, uh, so, this is... Of course, I'm also a, a person, and, and I hope a, a sort of decent person, so I'm not only like that, uh, but a bit. Uh, in that way, right? And then you might be the researcher here looks at environmental policy. And then you might say that in this area, for example, well, I don't care about these fiddlings in the clinic. The most important thing is that we, you know, stop this uh, irresponsible production practices of pharmaceuticals, for instance. Uh, what that will mean is that the price for antibiotics will go up like that. And this will, of course, have consequences over there. You see my point? So, and, so this is just a few examples. So depending on the role you think you're in and the perspective you take in your ethical thinking, the solutions and, and the conclusions that you draw will be different. And because society is full of all of these roles and all of these perspectives, you see a lot of dilemma and conflict coming out of that. Uh, yeah, so you have that, different kinds of things. And, and, and this leads to differences of stakes and options and outcomes that you will prefer. And this makes it, of course, difficult to have a harmonized policy or something like that in an area like this. Right? Okay, so quick, three challenges. Yeah. So challenge one is this thing about the conflicting institutional ethics. This sort of follows immediately from the thing I just went through, right? So... So you have different kinds of institutions that focus on different things, just like, you know, the institution of, of school is, is focusing on a different thing than the institution of the police in society. They do different jobs, and sometimes there's a conflict. Sometimes a child in school commits a crime, and there will be a conflict of interest between the institutional roles. So this happens all the time. So, for example, this whether you focus on repairing what's broken, or, or you fo focus on sort of trying to preserve the tools for future repairs. So here you have to preserve the tools for future repairs. You want to restrict the prescription of antibiotics, for instance, but to repair what's broken, you want to have this kind of stewardship, as Gunnar would have said, this kind of responsible prescription, but how much, and so on. So that's just one uh, example of this. Uh, yeah, so another aspect is, for example, the conflicts they can have between the institution of business and the, the, the institution of thinking in terms of the global public health, right? Because businesses can be large, but they are a special kind of interest. They're governed by certain kinds of institutional roles that are different from the ways that the government, for instance, think about the, the public health of the country. Uh, so different concerns that they have. Or uh, conflicts within or even between institutional ethical communities, right? So, 
so different kinds of uh, so I think that for example immigration and global moment is, is here a very good example because immigration is of course one thing that contributes to the antibiotic resistance challenge right but on the other hand that the fact that people travel a lot also contributes a lot to uh, our really good economy so thanks to that, uh, we have a lot of resources to, to try to deal with the problem. So, so there's, and of course, immigration is also a way to care a lot for public health, that we can take care of sick people in other places with low resource settings, you can move them here and take care of them, or we can move our resources and professionals to other places and help them like that. So this is also an aspect, of course, of, of migration. So, so the, at the same time, we know there's a political pragmatics here that people can be upset about migration and things like that. That can also come in and influence a questions like that. So you might be afraid that the restrictions that you might want to do on migration from this, from the public health perspective, is being hijacked, for instance, by nationalists' interests or racist interests, for instance. So here, it becomes really complicated very quickly when you think about it. Uh, <coughs> Another challenge, so this is the thing you need to understand when you understand these problems. It's called collective action problems. They create very specific ethical problems. And this is a crash course in collective action problems. So basically the starting point for collective action problems is that we have already agreed now that um, we have, we have agreed on these norms and values, whatever they are, so we, we have agreed on we need to do this to handle the drug resistance problem very well. And that this is X. This needs to be done. So suppose we have agreed on that. And we understand that in order to do that, X, X, these actions need to be done. Three different actions need to be done in order to produce this joint result. It's like your three friends, we need three kroner to buy whatever we want to buy. We have one kroner each. Everybody needs to put in their kroner to get the three kroner together, right? This needs to be done by three people over here, right? P1 needs to be X1, P2, X2, P3, X3. All fine, we understand that. Here's what often happens. Enters the norms and values, not on this level, but on the personal, individual level of each of these acting parties. So I'm thinking, no, I want to save my crown for tomorrow. So I'm not putting it in. I have some other concern, which is smaller, of course, than the large concern over here. But then I'm also uncertain about whether the other ones will put in their share. And if they put in their share, why should I contribute? Maybe I can be a free rider. This is, this is a classic social problem, social coordination problem. So taxation was, always has this problem. It's important to have enough people pay enough taxes, otherwise it won't work. And it's the same over here. It's important to have enough people do enough of their part in order to have X happening. Uh, and this is not because people are evil or anything. This is just uh, because um, this is kind of rigged into people to act in this way. So we mix three, and they, they over there, they also, they think this is a good thing. So it's not that. Uh, <coughs> So here are some examples of this. So for example, that we accept, for example, to stay home from work school one week more with perhaps consequences then for our grades in school or for whether or not I keep my work or my salary level or things like that. That voters support politicians who do things then that's uncomfortable in various ways to handle this problem over here. Uh, this is why we have politics basically to, to manage these things. Things. So they might legislate even that, well, we don't get as much sick leave before or, or we have new rules for prescribing antibiotics or, or we have more expensive food or something like that. Companies that they accept action that might reduce profit for the owners, for example, and, and they might lose some competitive advantages. So these factories in, in, in some countries that, that don't give a shit about what they emit into the environment, for instance, the, why do they do it? Not because they're evil, but because they want to be, have a competitive advantage and sell their stuff cheap. That's basically why they do it as companies, right? So how should you get the companies to get on the rail? If don't, they don't get on the rail, we're not going to do this, right? And states also, of course. So to collaborate also 
when it's to the disadvantage of your particular citizens. So, for instance, so, so, uh, and this we know from climate change. So a lot of, of the antibiotic problem is about that. So this challenge number three then is, is about, you know, so we're trying to do things in an area. So going to make this very clear that certain things we just don't know. We don't know the size of the problem. We don't know its exact components. We don't know what possible pathways ahead could be more or less promising. Well, we're guessing some of them might. Uh, but we don't know until we failed or succeeded, right? So this means we need to continuously then value this situation of uncertainty under a situation of high stakes, because if we go for the wrong thing, we lose big in this kind of uh, area, right? So one area here is research ethics. This is one of my speciality areas. It's one of the things we think about. So, so, also, so how much do we need to know about a new antibiotic, for instance, about a new tool for better diagnostics or a new sort of screening thing, method in the hospitals or something like that to screen for risk. How much do we know, need to know about it before we start to use it? This is why we have Lekemedelsverket or the FDA uh, to, to test these things so that we feel that they are reasonably safe and effective before uh, we use them, right? But this also means that it takes a longer time. And since this is a high-stakes problem, we may want to have the things quicker. And one way to do that would be to relax a little bit the safety requirements, for instance. And then we will have to accept, for instance, that we will have a higher incidence of people that are harmed by the new drugs that we develop, although these drugs also help us to uh, mitigate the resistance development problems. So that, that's a kind of a thing. So, and there's complete uncertainty all of the time, right? So we're reducing our knowledge, basically, in order to get the quick fix. And how much should we do that? And this also applies, and this is really important, I think, this also applies to, to the fixes we want to do to legislation and policy and organization and international treaties, because they, this is also, of course, an area of large uncertainty. Often when you do a political action, you don't know anything about what it's going to lead to. You, do le you know a lot less than when you roll out a new drug, for instance, because that's at least been tested somehow. Most political solutions have never been tested. It's like guesswork. It's often a theoretical idea that this might lead to that. But so new legislation, for instance. At the same time, we know if you make a new law, it will usually take like 20 years to change it if you want to change it, if it doesn't really work well. Because the politics is a slow, rigid, uh, complicated process. So, uh, so these kinds of things are also sort of high stakes decisions that need to be made under uncertainty. And the ethics here is to value this uncertainty, to say, okay, so it's important enough here to take the chance, to make the call, although there is this uncertainty for instance. So to say that, okay, so let's subsidize pharmaceutical companies to develop more antibiotics, although we know that there's a risk that they will, of course, manipulate the use of these kind of incentives, because it's just money for them, right? So, um, but then you have to think clearly about it and think, okay, so suppose we don't do it, how, what's the consequences then? Uh, <coughs> right, so that was this, this is some literature. Uh, and Anne will fix you the PDFs from this and some websites where you can uh, pick up information, especially the CARE website, of course. Uh, and most important, okay, most important, <laughs> it was just, I was hoping there was going to be something there, okay. No, well, there we go. So I am there, and if you ha is there time for any question? I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah. Questions? Well, I think so. there are differences between... I, I did the sort of comparison to the climate change issue, and there are some similarities. There are also differences. So there is the difference that in this area, a rich country, a filthy rich country, like our country, can actually isolate ourselves a little bit, right? So, um, and of course, if there's also a lot of social instability following climate change problems, the, the incentives for isolating yourself will be stronger. 
right? Uh, and this is a bad thing because this means that we allow the problem to grow, basically. While this is at the same time often the sort of the first reaction that you have when you perceive a danger. Also on the political level, let's isolate ourselves from the danger. Let's go inside when it uh, starts to be really windy or something like that, right? So, um, so it's understandable, but then to have this recent argument that at the end of the day, this strategy will bite you in the in the back when you come back. This is, this is often, so to, for example, to understand the collective action problem and the logic of the collective action problem and how that sort of often eats up the thing that you really hope to sit on uh, at the end of the day uh, when you have rescued yourself from the danger. So, and, and so this is important. This also makes people more interested in collaboration. And I think, so that's the opposite strategy then. And I think in, in a lot of these areas, Collaboration will be important, but for example, so in this area you will have this kind of tension, right? So we need to collaborate globally and internationally, and especially we need to do a lot for those countries where there is, it's very rational, for instance, to host a factory that emits a lot of antibiotic into the environment. It's a rational choice to do that when you're in a certain situation. It's not good for us, though. So... Uh, then we need to address some things that are more complicated, and that's always politically complicated. But I think the tension here is that we need to go global. At the same time, global is part of the problem here. So this is also different from climate change. Global is not really part of the problem here. It, climate change occurs wherever these emissions are. Here, actually, our globalization is helping these bacteria to move around the globe. It's us that move around them, right, basically, uh, with our food and our own bodies. That's basically what we do. So, that's, so here you can see a strain, and this creates, if you're a little bit internationalist like myself, uh, most researchers are quite internationally minded, uh, but then that's kind of uncomfortable because then you understand, well, maybe I shouldn't go to so many conferences. Maybe I should do them on the web instead. But I like meeting my nice colleagues and, you know, having nice conference dinners in, in wherever we are, in Barcelona or whatever. So we do this all the time. That's really important, right, to do that in order to collaborate and be able to agree. But then it's also a cost to it. It it's also contributes to the problem. So... So I can't have it, but I think it's a choice here. So, um, but just, I mean, for me, it's just if people can see that they have to make choices, that's the first step to the solution. So I think the most, the, the, the most horrible danger is when you pretend you don't have to make choices, when you pretend you can eat the cake and, have, and, and keep it right. So, so that's the most dangerous. In, in this area as well as a lot of other areas. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for your questions. <laughs>